It is a pleasure to be with you tonight to speak on a topic so essential to our understanding of the 19th century history of Manchester. As a historian, I am not here to tell you stories or entertain you. I am here to bring you the fruits of a lot of deep research into the life and times of this woman, Abigail Hooper Trask, who, amongst other things, is the only woman we know of in Massachusetts who became a self-made entrepreneur without men's money and who built her own house for herself when she was unmarried. And that house today is the Manchester Historical Museum. So, over the course of this bicentennial year of Nabby's house, we'll be looking at various aspects of the 1800s and meeting some notable folks along the way. To me, none is more interesting than Abigail, a determined, self-made female entrepreneur at a time that women had no political rights, no career paths, no access to higher education, and no place in the competitive business world of men. Nabby did not get the boy's memo. So some of you may have been here back in November uh, when I spoke about, uh, about her youth and her young womanhood. I'm going to review that a bit tonight. Um, but I, I will say that this person who we see up on the screen, Mrs. Abigail Hooper Trask at that point, was in many ways the leading personage, man or woman, during the very decades of 1820 into the 1850s, that little Manchester blossomed as the home to an extraordinary crew of people, educators, authors, inventors, artisans, manufacturers, and their impressive and improbable achievements. The woman, Abigail, was first a girl, Nabby Hooper, a girl like no other, about whom I gave the talk a few months ago. So we're going to take a quick look back at the outset of this talk. Nabby was born in 1788 into the post-revolutionary world in which the fate of virtually every teenage girl was to be placed into domestic service. And when we talk about domestic service in those days, it doesn't presuppose that there were wealthy people to employ these girls. It's that they didn't grow up in their own homes and they might, they might simply move a couple of doors down and become uh, domestic servants to a neighbor or a relative. But the idea was at the age of 12, a girl's education ended, as it did for boys. But boys would then be apprenticed into a trade, the trade that they would follow most of them for the rest of their lives, whereas girls had no trade other than domesticity. So a 12-year-old girl like Nabby in the year 1800 could have no expectation other than going to work in another household in Manchester and tending the children and learning how to clean and cook and uh, become somebody capable of eventually of running a household and doing this for the next eight years until some guy came along and asked her to marry him. And that was the fate of every teenage girl in this town. No agency, no way forward other than to clean, cook, tend, and wait. And uh, so one of the extraordinary things about this girl is that she simply wasn't interested in doing that. It's pretty clear that from an early point, she wasn't going to wait around to get married because she probably didn't think of marriage as something that applied to her. 
So alone of the girls of her generation in Manchester, she was able to talk her mom, her father was dead, was able to talk her mom into allowing her to be placed in a millinery shop in Gloucester. There were no such things in Manchester, but Gloucester was the big city. So she was able to dodge the fate of most girls of that time and move on into the business world, leaving behind her friends here in Manchester for quite a while to uh, deal with their fate as domestic servants. So in a milliner's shop, uh, bonnets were the big deal of the time. Everyone wore hats. Men wore hats and women wore bonnets. And um, at the shop in Gloucester, she learned how to make bonnets and became quite proficient at it. And other, other young women would have been selling cloth and textiles by the skein. In those days, there was no ready-made clothing so that people would go into a shop like this shop in Gloucester and, and purchase large bolts of cloth and if they were skilled with a needle, uh, some of the women would be able to turn that into clothing, but many more would take it to the local tailor, and the tailor would, would make custom clothing out of the really beautiful textiles that would come out of a shop in Gloucester. It's, it's hard for us to imagine, but most of these shops dealt in at least 20 different types of cloth. And uh, and people were very conscious of their appearance. They only had two or three different changes or suits of clothes. So they put a lot of money and care into that. And for years, Nabby had a chance to see the choices that people made, to learn how to uh, make the clothing that she was allowed to make, but more important for her was the opportunity to watch a business and how it was conducted. Because from the beginning, she had a uh, very clear understanding that it was important to understand how businesses were run rather than simply to serve the business person because in her mind, I think it's pretty clear from the outset that she planned to come back to Manchester and open a store. And in those days, Manchester had very, very few stores. Um, by the time she was 21, she was back in Manchester. She lived in Kettle Cove. She opened a small shop. It dealt mainly in cloth, not so much in bonnets. And uh, by that age, 21, she had found a way to make enough money that she, she became a proprietor of the Manchester Meeting House. She was always devout, but not only did she attend worship service, she also owned a piece of the Meeting House in which she attended. To run a store in those days, you had to be pretty good at your own accounting. And fortunately for us, we do have uh, a wonderful collection of her business ledgers starting in 1814. And here you see the title page of one of them. And I hope that you can see up at the top, but you can't because of the screen. Anyway, there's the name Nabby, and I should say, Abigail was a fairly common name, and at least in Manchester and many other North Shore towns, the standard nickname for Abigail was Nabby, not Abby at the time. So she was always known as Nabby Hooper, and, and her mom was known as Nabby Hooper as well, even though she was also an Abigail. So as I say, they dealt in many different types of cloth. Many of the um, clothes that people wore, as I say, were, were quite beautiful and, and very carefully thought out in terms of 
of their costume. And we see at a very early point the kinds of things that uh, Nabi dealt in in her Kettle Cove store because she was robbed. And um, at the time that somebody broke into the store and stole everything, she posted a notice in the newspaper and, uh, and itemized all the things that had been taken from the store. That's the only way we know. This is before the ledger books. So here is a list of the different types of cloth that she was selling. And um, she was putting up a $50 reward, which was a lot of money in those days. And the $50 reward was uh, $20 for the return of the materials and $30 for the capture of the men who loaded it up and drove away in their wagon one night. So in, in the early days, uh, as I say, we do have her ledger accounts. In the early days, we see her trading in a variety of textiles. She was making bonnets. She was buying bonnets from other people at uh, wholesale and retailing them from her shop. But she, at an early point, had already started selling commodities like coffee and rum by the gallon, and bitters, which were pretty much 110% proof brandy. So um, she, saw, she saw liquor as, uh, as a big profit center for her bonnet shop, is the best way to put it. OK. So that gets her through her young womanhood. This is a portrait of her in her 30s. And by the 18-teens, after the War of 1812, um, she is, she's a bit torn about staying in Manchester. This is a very small town. There are only about 1,000 people, all told, living in Manchester in those days. So it's not exactly the kind of place where your ambitions are going to make you rich. However, we see her in 1818 1819 and 1823, uh, buying and selling real estate. So she's kind of committed to the local scene. She is designated in these deeds as a trader, which is quite significant. Earlier, she was seen as a, a milliner. That was the legal term for her at the time. And by, by the early 1820s, she's seen as a trader. And, a milliner is more specific to the type of things that she was selling, women's clothes, women's bonnets, whereas in those days, a trader would be somebody who was running a store. Often it's a, it's a term for a grocer, but really it's anyone who's dealing, who is dealing in trade. And in this case, we have to think of her as not just selling things for cash, but she's also bartering things. So she has to have a great calculating mind. As people come into that store with a basket of fish or a bushel of corn or something else, she's got to be able to figure out whether or not what they want is, is either less or more valuable than what they're bringing in. And it's also true that this is before the American market economy, so currency is all over the place. Uh, people are still dealing in the English system more than an American system. They're dealing in pounds and shillings and pence. So she has to be able to calculate the value of that. A lot of people, particularly those who are mariners, are coming home with the currency of the places they've visited. So she has to be able to do conversions in her head as to French currency or Spanish currency and, cal and calculate value so that she's always making a profit. OK. so. What we know about her from the assessment records in 1820, again, this is an unmarried woman. This is, this is virtually unprecedented in Massachusetts for a woman to do this thing at all. So she is there in the assessment records all on her own, and she's assessed in 1820 for a shop that is worth 100 bucks, a house lot that she has already bought for $50, an old garden for $40, 
a 14 acre pasture, which is over in Kettle Cove, and that's worth 160. And she has her own chaise, so she has a carriage to get around in, and stock in trade in her store worth $900. So she's 32 years old at this point, and um, she's already got a business going. She's bought real estate. She has moved from Kettle Cove into the center of Manchester. She and two of her brothers, who received an inheritance from their father, who was a Kettle Cover, um, were able to sell some of his agricultural land for a house and, and land on North Street. So uh, that's where they lived in those days. The house is, is long gone. So we know that by that time, by 1816, 1817, she has moved from Kettle Cove into the center of town, and she has a store here. We don't know exactly where that store is, but I, I would suggest that it's likely that the store was um, where the uh, library is today. In those days, there was quite a large building, and you're going to see it, that belonged to her mother's family, who were the Crafts. Uh, Manchester was, in those days, still uh, coming out of a war, was a, uh, a fishing town, it was a poor place, no one really had any money, and by the 1820s, um, even the town's fishery was fading, so it was, um, it was, it was uh, a place where many houses went unpainted into the 1820s with, with other marks of poverty and lethargy all over this town. Um, sickness abounded in small towns like this. Uh, in, at this time, there might have been one doctor in town or they might have shared a doctor with, with uh, Essex or Gloucester. So in March of 1823, one of Abigail's customers, Mrs. Lucy Dennis Tink, who was 35 years old, her same age, died of consumption, or, or what we think of today as tuberculosis, uh, leaving two young children. Her husband was a sea captain. It's likely that he was on a voyage at the time that his wife died. There was no cure for consumption, and it was the, by far the biggest killer of people in any of uh, the coastal towns. Uh, and it, it would certainly be the case that Abigail would attend the funeral, but she would also sell the uh, liquor and the crepe for the funeral. So it, it was a poor town. Um, Abigail didn't want to be poor. She was a healthy, ambitious person, thinking of her future, as we all do, <clears throat> including, <clears throat> by this time, at the age of 35, perhaps thinking of marriage. <clears throat> Pardon me. And she thought of moving to Augusta, Maine, uh, the capital of a new state, where she had a half-brother who was doing well, a man named Samuel Smith, and she thought to start over there. And we have an exchange of their letters as, as she is sounding him out. But her store is still making money in Manchester and Manchester is her home. So we see in November and in the spring, in November of 1822 and in the spring of 1823, for $175, Abigail Hooper, now called legally a shopkeeper, buys a half interest in a piece of land in downtown Manchester. It's across from quite the mansion, uh, one of the few mansions of this town, of Captain John Lee. So she buys half of a, of a whole parcel that was about 100 feet on the street. She divided it and kept the western part, or had the western part, and it fronted about 50 feet on the road. And on it, she had a modest house built. And it was built by this man, a contractor, Deacon Isaac Stanwood of Ipswich. 
who was an experienced builder, which probably implies that there were no experienced builders in Manchester, or at least none that owed her money or that she cared to deal with. Um, among, among other surviving structures that we can attribute to Stanwood is his own house. So here it is on Green Street in Ipswich, and this is the standard, handsome, middle-class wooden house of its time with a pitch roof and a balanced symmetrical facade, traditional clabberding and the projecting entry porch as a frontispiece. And it has a little lean-to in the rear. So this is the standard house of the time, this is the sort of thing that Mr. Stanwood is building for people, and that wasn't exactly the idea that um, Abigail had in mind. So this is the house that she had built. As you can see, it has an asymmetrical facade and a shallow hip roof and uh, a modest entryway at the front and the side. We know that this house was finished or nearly finished, by July of 1823 because, again, she's writing to her brother about it. It uh, consisted of three rooms downstairs, including a kitchen L, and two more upstairs with an attic. From the start, we know that she was quite dissatisfied with the way the house was being framed, and uh, and, and, and probably dissatisfied in other ways with herself for even, even having built the house because it was going to anchor her to Manchester. And, and the idea of being able to run off to Maine or to start over again in some place that was more prosperous was out of the picture for a while in, in, in having built this house. So in the, in the letter that she sends to her half-brother of July 1823, she says, our house gets on well. Mr. Stanwood with two others from Ipswich is at work here, and we have others. She'll probably get into it in two or three weeks from this. I more than half repent the building, for I think if I, if I had not, I should have gone to Maine with you. But all is well that ends well. I will not repine. Samuel. I should like to have you here for a few days to do a little painting for me, as I think you would do it better than anyone I can get in this town. But still I am glad you are not here, as you have been for years past. I'd rather my house should never be painted, but the outside is now painted. As you can see, she has some regrets, even as this thing is being built and painted. Ariel Burgess has done it, and, it is, and is to do the rooms. All things have gone as well as I could expect since the framing. I'm sorry that I had not taken E's advice, we don't know who E is, and taken it down and had it framed over and have no doubt, but I should if I had been a man and been on it and seen it. But it is too late now to repent. So apparently in the course of the framing of the house, she was pretty dissatisfied with Stanwood and his crew. And, um, and I think what she's implying here is she, if she'd been a guy, she would have climbed up on the frame, taken a look, and, and told him why it needed to come down. But um, she wasn't. She was a lady standing on the ground looking up at men working on this house that was being built for her. So, so she naturally would have some question about whether she'd made the right decision here. Where would Manchester's prosperity be coming from? Because it certainly wasn't present here in 1823. Did she make a mistake in staying and doing this? And anyway, while she was running a profitable business, she must have thought that at last, at the age of 35, she deserved her own house and a place where she could also provide a home for her shop girls who worked for her in the store, as well as for the domestics whom they were probably training because I don't see Abigail as a domestic person or as somebody who was interested in training other people about how to cook. Okay. 
And I should, I should point out, this is the way the building looks today. So this is what it's become, and this is what she built. So as you face the house, it's the left, it's the left side of the present building. And today there's also a, um, a room that sticks out of the roof, which wasn't present at, in the original house either. This is Nabby's handwriting. This is the letter to her brother. It's, uh, she's, she's a very poor speller. As I say, girls didn't get an education. So her, much of her spelling is phonetic. Her handwriting is not great. Handwriting was usually, a penmanship was something that was an accomplishment of men and boys, and it was a, a big deal to write a nice hand. Um, women, women, women generally didn't. Girls gen generally didn't. And, um, and I must say, when she wrote a letter, she tried hard with her best handwriting, but um, in her ledger accounts, the uh, handwriting is often very, very difficult to decipher. And I must say, one of the good things about your museum is that we have a part-time archivist, graduate student, Matthew Swindell, who has, uh, shall we say, an uncanny ability to parse out these very strangely written words in the ledger accounts. Uh, Matthew will be uh, speaking to you a little bit tonight as well. So just as the girls are settling into uh, Abigail's house, this man, Captain Richard Tank who I mentioned as being a widower at the, at the beginning of the talk. A customer for this door comes calling. He is the richest man in the town, newly widowed, father to a son named Richard, 11, and to a daughter, Mary, who is nine. He would need a new wife for his children. He is away at sea nine months of the year. And, um, Somehow, this shipmaster and this businesswoman find each other, and soon they are engaged in the very year that she builds the house. This, of course, involves a three-page prenuptial agreement. <laughs> and here it is, folks. So um, the captain had plenty of money of his own, to go to his two children in case of his demise. And under this contract, Abigail gets to keep all of the property that she owns at the time of the marriage and all of the money and property she might subsequently acquire wow. in the marriage. As I say, she's a pretty hard-headed businesswoman. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to applaud. Wow. Um, yeah. So her property was placed in trust for as long as Richard lived and, and dedicated, legally dedicated, to Abigail's separate use and benefit. Any breach by Richard would result in her property going to her heirs as if she and he had never married. So who is this guy, Richard Tink? We see him in 1809, when he was 20 years old, as a Manchester seaman, a deckhand, five foot three, with a light complexion. He is shipping out on a Salem brig, the exchange, on a voyage to Sweden, departing in March of 1809 with seven other men as the crew and a supercargo. And that's the business agent for the, for the uh, merchant who owns the cargo. So three of these sailors are from Manchester on this Salem vessel, which is quite typical. It's important to understand that Manchester had no commerce. It barely had a fishery. It had no real harbor in those days. It was pretty much a mud bank. The harbor that we know today was all dredged out in the 1890s. So there was only a tiny salt cod fishery and no merchant trade at all. So for the young men of Manchester, for the ambitious young men of Manchester, the ones who did not become fishermen, uh, to become a merchant mariner was a pathway towards becoming eventually a shipmaster and a merchant. 
And so a few of the boys of Manchester were on that track, but they had to go elsewhere to get their berths. So they would sail out of Salem or they would sail out of Boston. And on this voyage where we see Richard as a young, young guy before he marries, at the age of 20, he's on board the exchange with uh, Nathan Lee Jr., 21 from Manchester, and Samuel Morgan. And of course, growing up in a tiny town, it's very likely that these guys were good friends. What we know about Richard Tink is that he was born in Salem, that he probably, probably his father never saw him. He never saw his father. His father was a young mariner who was lost at sea, uh, evidently before he was born. His mother's maiden name was Trask, which is an old Salem name. And so as a baby, he was growing up in a fatherless household. His mother had one old, living older brother who was 29 and her own mother who was 55. It was a small family. It had no money. And so like many of the widows of young mariners in places like Salem and Marblehead, Rebecca had no means of supporting herself since, as I say, women were not raised to have careers but only to become wives dependent on their husbands. Husband is dead. She had no means to support herself. Her family, her brother and mother had no means to take care of her and her little baby. So they were sent off to the Salem Alms House to live off the charity of the town. And that is where Richard grew up until about the age of 12, when a, the town a clerk of Manchester, a man named Aaron Lee, decided to bring these two, two Salem boys, a, man, a boy named, a uh, last name of Murray, and this kid Tink, to essentially buy them out of the Manchester almshouse and bring them into his family and apprentice them to become fishermen for him. So this is how Richard ends up in Manchester, by being taken out of the penury of the Salem almshouse. And it is interesting to me that his mother eventually catches up to him and moves to Manchester and spends the rest of a very long life in, in Manchester. She never, she never did remarry, and in fact, she, she ends up outliving her son. So in February of 1811, Richard marries a woman named Lucy Dennis in Manchester. They would have three children. One dies young. Um, he probably privateered during the War of 1812. He went out as a, as a deckhand on privateers that were preying on merchant shipping of the British. And in 1817, we first see the Tinks as customers of Abigail. They are buying coffee and satinette cloth. They live on the upper part of School Street between the households of Andrew Lee and of a man named Christopher Lee, who was one of the of heads of, of the few black families in town. As I mentioned, like all the ma merchant mariners in Manchester, he had to sail out of Salem or Boston to make a living. And the living that these guys made as kids was always extremely dangerous. There was very, very high f fatality involved, both in fishing and in, in the merchant marine. Lots of accidents falling out of the rigging, lots of ships that would wreck, and lots of tropical diseases in the ports that they visited. Another image of a sailor. Not really his mom, but sort of look at somebody who didn't have money in those days. And an idea of maybe somewhat what uh, Lucy Dennis Tank, his first wife, appeared like. Um, he'd become a shipmaster at a young age. He was, he was an incredible self-made person with, with great abilities and probably the habit of command. And we see him have a, uh, a very steep upward arc in his career as a mariner and, and become a shipmaster in Boston with some of the uh, wealthiest of the overseas traders. So, um, by the 1830s, he is commanding full rig ships like this. 
He is working for Samuel Train of Boston, who had begun as an importer of hides from overseas, but by the 1830s had become a general merchant dealing in all kinds of commodities. So Richard Tink of Manchester is sailing all around the known world, picking up goods for the merchant house of Samuel Train. We know that he made at least one voyage in which they put into Marseille, because you are looking at a really beautiful watercolor in the collection of the Manchester Historical Museum um, by Antoine Roux of Marseille, who was a specialist in painting the uh, ships of, of the Americans who came into the port and then selling those paintings back to the captain. So in this case, you're looking at the Forum, quite a large ship, and the captain of that, of that large ship is Richard Tink. Yeah. So he, his specialty soon becomes the trade in the Baltic with Russia. Samuel Train, train like so many of the ambitious Boston mariners, will go anywhere to try and make money. And Train is very successful in opening trade with St. Petersburg. And Richard Tink of Manchester is his most important uh, captain in this very important trade. So, you know, by the time he meets uh, our friend Abigail, he has already made his own fortune and is very well known in, uh, in important places and had even been introduced in court to the Tsar. Ultimately, Richard Tink is able to start buying into the vessels that he's commanding. So the trains cut him in on ownership, both of the ships and the cargoes. So he, become, he actually became wealthy. He did not leave Manchester, and he never built a big house for himself. But he is the commander of the St. Petersburg, which is the very largest vessel sailing out of Boston in the 1830s. And <clears throat> he's a quarter owner of this enormous vessel. So <clears throat> when we look at Manchester and the, the people who live here, even though we see no large mansions, we see some extremely able mariners who have made quite a good career for themselves. So at the time of their marriage, it is likely that he and his two children move into the little house that she had built in 1823, which is the year they marry. Suddenly, Abigail, who has been single all her life and maybe resigned to that, <clears throat> is the mother of two stepchildren. And one year later, she is the mother of a baby boy whom they name Charles. So she has gone from being a single storekeeper to a busy mom. And what we see happening here is in 1829, they buy the piece of land next door to the little house they've been living in, and they double the size of the house. She doesn't stop her business. She's continuing to expand the, the businesses that she has across the street. And, and I guess the best way to look at it, she has evolved it all into a mini department store. She's selling just about everything to everyone in town. She is probably putting lots of smaller male shopkeepers out of business as she does so. Um, and an interesting thing to see is when they do add the other half to the house, they modernize the look with a sort of Greek revival aspect to it. There's a side colonnaded porch, which is there today. But more interesting is they built a projecting colonnaded front porch to break up the barrenness and, and the length of this very long house now. So it had a central focus to it with the same kinds of columns that you see over on the side porch. Um, it's quite a nice architectural move and uh, nothing else like this in Manchester. 
I've got to think that this is more of Abigail's taste being imposed on a building as certainly it was with the original build. But um, this is the house the way it looked starting in the 1830s. And it's interesting to see that that new east wing of the house is not being used by the Trasks for their residence. They've literally built this on for rental income and there's always another family. These people are making money. <laughs> so what we know is that uh, from the census records, we know that in 1830, the Richard Trask household was here. And I, and I should point out, Richard Trask is never home. He, he's always at sea, like most of these mariners. They're, they're away from home nine to 10 months of the year. Um, so it's really, it's really Abigail and a couple of young women couple of teenage girls, um, and, and uh, I found there are two other men and two young men in the house as well who are probably boarders. Her little boy, Charles, who's six at that point, and in the other wing is a man named Benjamin Knowlton, uh, his wife, and their two boys and two girls. So it's full of humanity here, and, and Manchester is improbably now suddenly on the rebound. As I mentioned, in the 1820s, it was in sad shape. But along comes this guy, John Perry Allen. And Allen is an inventor and a furniture maker, and um, also a, a good customer of Abigail, who was the first person in America to figure out how to produce high volume, high quality mahogany veneers, which meant that he could produce pine furniture that looked like mahogany and get a huge markup, and he did. And he found that the biggest market for the furniture that he was able to create was down south, particularly Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans. So by the late 1820s, Manchester has become a center of furniture manufacture, and it is national enough in scope that its largest customers are in the deep south. That's going to bring money into Abigail's store because lots and lots of people from other parts of Massachusetts seeing what's happening in Manchester come flocking into Manchester to get in on this. So young men who've been working in cabinet maker shops in other towns see the opportunity of coming to work for a man who is an innovator and in building a big a big business. This is the kind of, for, sorry about the image being cut off at the top. This is the kind of veneer, uh, mahogany veneer, that, that uh, John Perry Allen was able to apply to his pine furniture and, uh, and able to make a lot of money in doing so. So suddenly, this town, which seemed pretty sketchy to Abigail, in 1823 was in the money with lots of people coming in and adding to the population and lots of skilled people, so they're making money. Um, they add to Abigail's prosperity. The captain is still doing very well. Um, and then one night in 1836, as John Perry Allen has done this other extraordinary thing in applying a steam power, he's got a steam powered furniture mill Almost everything, everything else that was done through, in, in terms of power, was done through water. But this guy has actually commissioned a man to make a steam engine, and so he is producing, whenever he wants, he's producing furniture. Uh, but unfortunately, um, steam power came with a lot of fire and a lot of danger, and he set the center of, the, of Manchester on fire and burnt down about 12 buildings in 1836, including his own house, and his own factory. So, so the Trask would have had a, a uh, ringside seat on w watching Manchester burn up. And no doubt by the time the firemen finally got a handle on it, they'd already packed up all of their furnishings and, and were ready to clear out. So uh, at this point, I would like to turn over this narrative, this cliffhanger, uh, to Matthew Swindell and give him a chance to tell you a little bit about the things that he's found in doing the research that we've been doing together. Take it away. I'll, I'll take it. So, um, 18, happened in 1826, and they legally changed the name from Tink to Trask. There's documentation, legislature, and they re 
published in the newspapers. Um, and Quince Trask was the captain's mother's maiden name, you know, connected to that old Trask family. But um, why, why would she have done that? Why would she have done that? That's what I was just going to say. Why would she have done it? We don't know for sure, but um, there is uh, the convincing story that she didn't like the name Tink. She didn't quite want to be Mrs. Tink yeah. and have their son be Charles Tink. Well, no, it's more like, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and say what, what, what it really is. What, what it really is? Yeah, the people would, would pronounce it Mrs. Stink. Yes, well, yeah. I was trying to do so. Yeah, right. Mrs. Stink. I'll come out and say it. Oh. Mrs. Stink. Would you want to be Mrs. Stink? I don't think so. So Abigail, we, we think that it was Abigail who was behind having the name change. I mean, the captain had this name his whole life so, and with his first marriage, so he probably was not so bothered, but we can believe that Abigail was. So 1826. The Tinks turned to Trask, and everybody in the family changed. I mean, including the captain's first children, um, children from his first wife. Um, really, the only one that didn't change was the, t the captain's mother, Rebecca. She became the last Tink in town. <laughs> so, I'm going to take you to the next picture there. Uh, there's, um, I think that's the ledger of, I think that's the ledger of John Perry Allen right there, showing him buying all sorts of things, uh, like cloth, muslin, toe, ribbed cashmere, cambric, green silk braid, sugar, salt, tea, cheese, butter, rice, suspenders, uh, sal radis, that's a predecessor to baking soda, uh, sundries, so all sorts of things he was buying at Abigail's store. And uh, there's the town of Manchester. So uh, there was, it was in the money with this cabinet furniture making industry. A lot of skilled migrants adding to the town. Um, so Bob went into that. Um, and of course he also went into the, how the town almost burned down. So there's a picture of the town from the 1830s. So this would have been the town that Abigail would have recognized at that time. So here's something else she might have recognized and not been so pleased to see. Um, so in the original part of the house, there was the trash and their domestic servants, shop girls. Um, now, unfortunately, Captain Trask's son, Richard, now he was a bit of a handful. He, well, I'm going to get to Charles. He, Richard's not the one that caused this, though we hear that Richard was sort of a handful anyway. Um, Richard, he unfortunately, he went off to New York. He lost a lot of money in the bowling alleys. Um, and then he went off and joined the Marines. He was a cook. And uh, he was in the Seminole Wars in Florida, and fortunately that was an unhealthy climate for, he, for him. He died of dysentery. So Richard died. The captain's daughter, Mary, she, well, she married John L. Eden, and he was a cabinet maker, and he had, she had children and a house on School Street given to them by their father. Now, back at home um, with his father, or way at sea. Now here I'm getting to this pain. Uh, you might notice there's a little, it's a little hard to tell with the uh, darkness of the picture, but um, well, Charles was a lively boy and uh, somewhat spoiled, occasionally a pain, uh, and he was good with a diamond. He left his initials on the window glass here, so up on the second floor, and it's still there. That's a picture I took just the other day. There are the initials C-H-T inscribed on the window pane at the Trask house. So he left his mark, let's just say that. So uh, next we have a picture of a, a religious man, a clergyman. The 1830s saw much religious upheaval. There was a new Baptist church in Manchester uh, attracting followers from the Congregational Church, the established first parish. And uh, whose minister, Mr. Emerson, well, he eventually moved away. Uh, as usual, Abby, she played a leading role in uh, these religious politics. In August 1839, Reverend Oliver A. Taylor, as pictured, he was hired as minister. And uh, he and his family came to reside with none other than Abigail Hooper Trask in the new wing of the Trask House. Now, uh, speaking of religious devotion, uh, now, Abigail was a very religious woman, and she was joined by quite a special woman, Louisa Lord. Now, uh, 
Louisa Lloyd, at the moment that you had this religious upheaval in the late 1830s, um, in 1839, Lu Louisa Lord, who then went by Lois Lord, she was 29 years old. She came from Ipswich as a, when it was a session to, of assistance to Abbey, and she had just lost her mother, but she'd find a new mother here in Manchester. Um, she was special to Abigail. This was not just the hired girl. She became an adoptive daughter to Abigail. Uh, Louisa quite very much bonded with her. Um, she said Abigail was her new own mother. And uh, she would play the part of a daughter, a secretary, and a constant companion for the rest of her life to Mrs. Trask. Um, and in 1840, now she, she decided she had outgrown her lowest identity. That was her grandmother's name. And frankly, Louisa, she thought, she wrote that it was plain and ugly. And she took on the name Louisa. Now, Louisa, she was a temperance advocate, much to the anger of Dodge the innkeeper. And doubtless, she reinforced Abby's embrace of that movement. And at this point, I am going to give it back to Bob. And I will say that I've been working with Bob in the archives, trying to get uh, things carried away and straight away here in Manchester at the museum. No enthusiasm there, Matthew. <laughs> Ma Matthew is great to work with. He's, he's uh, I hope, I think he's, he's learned a lot and made a huge investment in, in the records and the lives of the people that we've been uncovering here in Manchester. So it is fun to be able to give Matthew a little bit of his due here tonight, and I, I, I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Okay, so back to Captain Trask. As, as you can see, although, although we know the house in terms of Abigail, it's, it's certainly because Abigail had an extraordinary life as a young woman and as a determined woman on her own. But it's also important to understand that uh, these people had a successful, long-lived marriage that was blessed with a child and, and with other children. And that uh, Richard, who becomes Trask, Richard plays a big part in the history of this house as well. So I didn't want to overlook him, and I've given you perhaps a bit more of his career than um, you might have thought, but he is, he is a type you know, he happens to be one of the more extraordinary examples of a type. But that type of, of fearless, intelligent young man who chooses the merchant marine to go into out of a town like Manchester is at a disadvantage in going into a, a berth on a Salem ship or a Marblehead ship or a Boston ship because the captains already have their friends, kids, and relatives on board. And, uh, and these boys have to have something extra. And, one of the, and that was recognized in Manchester. And I should mention that although it was a tiny place, Manchester was always very self-regarding. It's really interesting to see how few of these successful shipmasters move out of Manchester. Of course, they're at sea all the time. So it's more about their wives and children growing up here. Um, but but in, in the case of the generation of Richard Tink. As I say, he was a boy plucked out of dire poverty to do what he can to show what his abilities are given a fair opportunity, which was, a, that's what America was about, uh, uh, the opportunity for a kid like that to show what he was made out of under pretty tough conditions. One of the things that Manchester did that these other towns did not do is they, had, they hired a man named Stilson Hilton to open a little navigational school so that the boys, by the time they were 12 years old, were not just educated in ordinary grammar school. They'd had a chance to go to a school where they could at least learn the rudiments of navigation, which was critical to their futures as mariners. 
So it's one of the reasons that we see people like Richard Tink succeeding against all odds in these big ports is they had special education and they were smart enough to know what to do with it in competition with kids from other places. So about this interesting man, we can say that he rose to the very top of his profession. As I say, he was a part owner of the largest vessel in Boston. He was deeply involved personally, as well as on behalf of his merchant owners in trade with St. Petersburg with, with Russia. And in very early 1843, he is in command of this enormous vessel off, 11 miles off Liverpool, and they are hit by a hurricane, uh, a storm of the sort that he has never encountered in all of his years of seafaring. And um, he survived, they all survived, and he commissioned this painting of the St. Petersburg in the teeth of this hurricane, and there goes the last mast. He had, he had had to have the men come out on deck and cut away the masts, otherwise the ship was gonna flip and, and they would sink. So when they cut away the last mast, they had no way of controlling the vessel as it, as it w went through this hurricane. And they all just huddled down in the forecastle and prayed together and were certain that they were all going to die together. And instead, they, uh, they washed up on the shore, and the St. Uh, Petersburg didn't quite bilge. It, it uh, filled with about 10 feet of water, but it didn't fall apart. And so they were actually safe on the shore through the latter part of this storm. And it, came almost, it went away almost as fast as it had hit. So they actually survived it, and it took two years, but the St. Petersburg was rebuilt in England, and he was able to regain his command after that terrible storm. But it must have caused him, by the time he got home, to have some, some thought. He's in his early 50s. He's at the end of a career. And he must have asked himself what he was doing out there at that point. Um, it's interesting. By the time he came home, his wife, who had made a lot of money off booze, had been, had been caught up in the temperance movement and decided not, not only to um, eschew the sale of liquor in her store, but also to pull some strings to make her husband the new president of the Manchester Temperance Society. <laughs> so he had that little room upstairs uh, in the third floor, and I wonder if he might not have kept some souvenir bottles up there. <laughs> I'm um, thinking of the good old days. As, as he comes home, he does have a squad of little grandchildren by his daughter, the, the Eaton children, in, including a, a Richard Trask Eaton. He seems to have accepted this alien person from Ipswich, Louisa Lord, as a permanent fixture of the household. Although his son Charles, who is by now at Yale, is pretty deeply resentful of this intrusion. Uh, we don't know what happened, but suddenly, at home in 1846, pretty much just as he retired from the sea, he came down with a case of cholera and died. So at that point, and there he is, farewell Richard, <clears throat> At that point, there are just the two of them, of, of these Trasks. Abigail, who you see here, um, probably around 1860, and her son Charles. A handsome fellow, right? And mother and son would remain quite close for the rest of her very, very long life. She was a very demanding person, uh, of herself, as of her son, as you might imagine, and very, very anxious about his future. She had seen what happened to her stepson, as Matthew mentioned, um, Richard Tank Trask. It all starts in bowling alleys, folks. Just stay out. What can I tell you? Never go bowling. 
Um, but she was naturally quite concerned about this one boy left in the household and what might happen to him. He bounced around a bit. He went to prep school. He went to a couple of prep schools. Um, he made it into Amherst. That didn't last. He made it into the Andover Seminary to become a minister. But that was her idea, and he didn't want it. And he made it through Yale. So um, as, as he went from place to place, she would write him long letters about the condition of his morals and his soul. Um, and he would receive letters from his formerly very tough scolding nanny, Louisa, um, who would write him as a sister whether he wanted her to be or not. So um, finally, he ends up in New York City, this uh, very smart, good-looking guy, with some ambitions beyond what his mother might have imagined. He makes what they used to call a very good marriage into uh, a merchant family in Boston and New York. And he becomes the major business agent for the Ropes family's operation in New York City. He knocks it out of the park. He becomes a very wealthy man. He has eight children. Descendants are still out there. And, um, and must have made his mother very proud. So his, his life and career leaves mom at home. She has gone out of business in 1845, just before her husband died. She got almost all of his money. She had her own money. She was a very wealthy person. Um, and, and she gave up the business right about 1845. So that leaves her free to take a keen interest in everything else that's going on in town. And with her personality, she really is a dominant figure amongst all, certainly all females and certainly most of the males, as a private banker, a counselor to people, and a philanthropist. And uh, she continues doing this community business long after even the death of Louisa, with whom she had the closest possible daily relationship. Louisa, Louisa dies in 1872 at the age of 62. And after that, Abigail is pretty much on, on her own as a, a very elderly person, somebody who lives on into her 80s and then into her 90s and um, actually lives to become the oldest person in Manchester. And she is in her 96th year when she finally dies in April of 1885. And in the, in the obituary of Abigail Hooper Trask, written by someone who, who knew her well. And of course, everyone knew her well in a small town like this. It was noted that even as a little girl, she had exceptional, what they called, clarity of mind and amazing executive ability. And throughout her life, which is this extraordinary and really unique life of an American woman, she had not only lived for herself, but, but had definitely lived for the betterment of the community. And so it is, it's really a privilege for us here as members of the Historical Museum to, uh, to uphold the memory of, of this person and to have in our very museum building itself the home of this woman and these very interesting people. And I think you'll see in the coming months that we're making some changes that will do justice to these lives and, and make the narrative of the experience of visiting the museum something that will be really memorable to those of you who choose to visit. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. And I, 
And, and I'm very happy to take questions. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about the third floor room, which is still quite visible if you stand at the library and look back at the building. Um, it is a third floor room that projects from the roof of the original part of the house. So it was probably built pretty early on. And um, I think you have to think of the situation of a man intruding on a female household. In 1823, this house was full of women. It was full of, of, of the shop girls who worked for Abigail, as well as her domestic servants and her. And, and so the captain moves in with his kids. And either he, or perhaps when he was away on a voyage, let's think of it this way. While he was away on a voyage, his wife is a wonderful present for him, <laughs> built him a crow's nest so that when he came home from his voyaging, he would have a place where he could go off and, and be by himself and, and have a nice view over the town and do whatever he felt he wanted to do, kind of getting away from the girls. Uh, I, would, I would imagine that that might have been a motivator. So that's probably the reason for that room. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so over there. Good. Her name was Martha Ropes. Oh, Ropes. Yeah. Oh, from Salem. What? Yeah, well, this was, this was the same family that later becomes Ropes and Gray. And they had left Salem. They had gone to Boston. There was one generation where they were merchants, and then they turned into lawyers. Yeah. He, he married into the merchant generation. Yeah. Oh. Over there, yes. Well, sure, I, they, they weren't poverty-stricken. They were poor. But a lot of these, as I mentioned, a lot of these men were merchant mariners. It's important to understand the bigger picture of Essex County. Salem's um, foreign commerce had bottomed out. A lot of the opportunities for the young mariners in Manchester just weren't there the way they had been because of that. But it never fell to zero. Everyone was still making, making, earning a living, although it wasn't as good a living as it had been. So there was always enough going on in town. As I say, barter was part of it too. There was always enough going on in town that one really strong retailer with an assortment of all kinds of goods could still make money. And, but as you see from that letter in 1823, she was really on the bubble. She, she was really wondering whether or not she ought to stay here in Manchester or take a shot at a, at a, at a, a more economically viable place. But uh, it turns out only because of the coincidence of John Perry Allen's amazing invention of the mahogany veneer that um, she made a great bet. Because by the end of the 1820s, she was in a town that was prospering again. Yes? Do, uh, do you know the name of the milker, the, the shop in Salem, that made, I mean, sorry, Gloucester, that yeah. made the hats? I wish I did, yeah. Did she have a, did the hats have a name? I mean, did she put a name in the hats that she made, do you know? The bonnets? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, in our collection, we have exactly one bonnet and one old, old bonnet. And it's always been identified as a bonnet that Abigail or Nabby made. And then, um, sad to say, a couple of guys, well, Matthew and I, took a good, good hard look at that bonnet and we found <laughs> Buried in the rotten folds, we found a label from Boston. Yeah. Yeah. At the Colonial Games, we have a costume collection, and we're putting together, it's come out this summer, a show of hats, and focusing in on Boston and Boston area um, hats. Well, it, so if I could 
if you have a chance, please come over and visit, because the label is more interesting than you might think. You know, unfortunately, on the one hand, unfortunately, it's a Boston label, but across the bottom of the label, it says, Rue de la Paix, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the other thing that we have there that, that might be of interest to folks in general is a bonnet block, this sort of plaster of Paris block of a head that would, that would be wearing a bonnet on it. And um, that, too, was said to be something that Abigail had used in making the bonnets. And again, one of the things that Matthew and I have been trying to do is take a much harder look at, at these objects, not even so much at, at provenance as at the objects themselves. And it's been really interesting to look at the bonnet block almost through the microscope in that we found all kinds of writing on it, um, a couplet from a poem, uh, a reference to the A.C. Hooper and Company um, clothing company, and we have yet to track that one down. So there's all this inscription on, the, on this object that is so interesting and, and provocative. And it's so often the case when, when you end up with, with objects in a collection, they tend to take on a, a life of their own that um, we're not encouraged to question. And, and we've been questioning some of these objects, and it's really been interesting to get some answers here. Other questions? Yes, Amy? Right. So that's not equity stocks. That's that's her. That that's the stock in her store. Yes, nine hundred dollars. One of the things we know is that Abigail, at a very early point, was buying from Salem importers. So yeah. So she's dealing in in all kinds of high end cloth and silks that are coming directly from Asia to Salem. And she had, we, we know of four accounts, that, open accounts that she had with wholesalers. And then she's retailing that stuff in Manchester. I, I, I thought it might be the stock in the store, but then it seemed like she paid much money. It was there it is. As I, as I say, it, it's something hard for us to understand, I think unless everyone in this room is a Gucci buyer, how much of their income these people put into their clothing. They were so proud of their appearance. And, and cloth, there was such a great variety of cloth um, that, that it was, I'm sure for them, it was, it was you know, great fun and very flattering to them as basically you know, poor people to be able to dress well for each other on, on Sundays and other occasions. So somebody who's dealing in, in, in cloth is going to get the money from everybody in town, right? Everyone wants to look good. Other questions? Judy? The furniture company, when it burned down in 1836, did it revive? Yeah, so that was a... a it was really quite tragic for, for John Perry Allen because he is, he is really the man who, who made Manchester happen by the 1830s. And he had invested a great deal in very progressive um, industrial stuff. Very, very few other businesses, particularly businesses in uh, furniture making, were based on steam power. And, and he'd made that bet. And um, so he was very heavily capitalized in, in the equipment and the overhead. And when everything burnt up, which is not to, not to say that it wasn't disastrous for his neighbors too, but for him, um, he, was, he was drastically underinsured. And he never really recovered. He did, he was able to, to get his business going again. 
but it was never at quite the same level, and we see him going bankrupt in, in 1850 as well. So, you know, he, he was an inventor more than a businessman, and he'd found something very special that no one else in America had found, and, and he maxed out on it there for, for a while. But, um, and what Lots of other guys who were much smarter at the furniture business than he was. So, still in the same furniture making world. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it wasn't until after the Civil War that uh, Manchester kind of lost its mojo as a furniture center. Yes? How was her business affected during the war? During the Civil War? No idea, because she was out of business. <laughs> 20 years out of business by then. You know, we, the, the ledgers stop in 1845, and I assume that's because she stopped trying to run this retail business. Having her, she'd already amassed a lot of money, and her, her husband at the time of his death, which was the very next year, was worth 30,000 bucks, which doesn't mean much to us, but he'd be multimillionaire today. Uh, yeah, so, so her motivation for staying in business wasn't great. Yeah, well, we, we, you know, we actually don't know the full story. Now, her son, as I said, went off to New York City, but he also, later on, he, um, he bought that mansion across the street, and he rebuilt it. And he lived in Manchester with his family for maybe six or seven years. He'd made enough money that he didn't need to keep working in New York. So he could kind of retire, and it seems like he retired to Manchester for a while, he is her only heir, so he would have inherited everything from across the street. It, he had no motivation to sell it, so he kept the building, and apparently he kept the stuff in the building, probably upstairs, and he leased it to somebody who ran it as um, kind of a, a boarding house of sorts. So it stayed in the family until 1924. And where they stashed her stuff by 1924, I don't know. This would be the grandchildren's generation. But it stayed in the family for a long time. And the family apparently valued it and, and uh, you know, had high respect for their ancestor, as they should have, since she was the reason why her only son went off to Yale and became this successful person. And she lived this great long life to get to know other people as time went by and, and, and had a lot of respect. So no one was going to throw her stuff away. And, and there was just that tiny moment for about a year between when the house was sold and when it became the headquarters of the Manchester Historical Society that things might have been up for grabs, but they weren't. And so when the Historical Society bought the house, I imagine that most of these collections were still in that building. Yeah, very, very fortunate. Is that it? One, one more question? Does Jeremiah Lee fit into this story at all? Well, no. you haven't been reading Too Rich for Manchester, my it. continuing saga in the Manchester cricket. <laughs> Yeah, Jeremiah Lee does fit into it, and if you leave me your email address or whatever, we, we can give you, some, uh, give you a write-up that I've been doing for the local paper on the Lee family and how they left Manchester and went to Marblehead. So again, thank you very much for spending the evening out here. <laughs>